So, Justin. Yeah. You've been doing this podcast for two years? Over 100 episodes. E, e, well, yeah. As of right now, as, uh, by the time this airs, we'll be well into year three. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. Thanks. So you you sit you get to see, sit weekly with innovators and founders mm-hmm. and thinkers and educators and all artists, all kinds of people. What is is there a common thread? Like, what do you get out of it, and what do you hear over and over and over as people share their experience about being human and doing things? This is a new angle. And I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana College of Business. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. We are proudly underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. This week, we learn about a woman and a venture that epitomized this podcast's primary themes, creativity and hustle. I first met Paige Williams in 2013 when we did a project for her new venture at that time, Audience Awards. In the years since, she's been grinding away on that venture, trying to create something new. It started as the Audience Awards, but is now Odd Pop. We actually discussed that rebranding decision in this conversation. Beyond that, we cover a bunch of ground from Paige's own documentary filmmaking experience to some big ideas about gender and entrepreneurship and some unexpected questions for me. Oh, and then she schools me on slam poetry. I'm excited for you to more, learn more about Paige and the amazing work that she does right now. Okay, so we're here today with Paige Williams. Paige, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. So when you uh, debuted your movie, Mississippi Queen, were there a number of folks that were surprised not to see a movie about riverboats? <laughs> Was that what they were expecting? <laughs> And, the, and and a great disappointment to not hear the song, Mississippi Queen. Yeah, yeah. What was that like? Yeah, it was just full of disappointment for everyone involved. <laughs> I don't think so. The film did really well. It did do well. We had a good time. It was about a controversial topic. And yeah, tell us about that movie. Sure. Um, I went to, um, came back and did a graduate degree, an MFA here at the University of Montana yeah. in Media Arts. And graduated and was trying to figure out, like, what do I do now? Sure. And so I grabbed a couple of my film buddies, um, Bryce and Travis, and we went down to Mississippi to tell... Um, Back home. You'd grown up yeah, in Mississippi. Yeah, I grew up in Mississippi. And so we went there um, to tell the story of my parents, and I tried to stay out of it, but was unsuccessful, because they uh, ran an ex-gay ministry in Mississippi. And which what does is, that mean, an ex-gay ministry? Yep, it's for people who don't want to be gay because of Jesus. Okay. Yeah. And so I went down there to tell that story and just like what it's like to be raised in the South um, with that kind of belief system. In the first summer we shot, um, I, you know, I, I, I shot a little bit with them. We shot a little bit with some of the people that they worked with in their organization. We shot uh, with um, a group in Memphis where it was actually like a treatment center for people who oh, don't want to be gay. Yeah. Yeah. That like has since closed the out. down. Uh. And yeah, and the, the person who ran it um, has apologized and is now married to a man. Hmm. And um, but this, was in, this was in 2000 and five, I think. Okay. And so it, it was quite a while ago. Um, but this was a hot topic then. Mm-hmm. And this was very alive and well. And um, conversion therapy is what they call it. And so we went down and shot and, and came back and then we edited together like a little, I grabbed another friend from grad school and he edited with me like a maybe a 10 or 15 minute piece. And we showed it to some friends. Yeah. I said, what do you think? And they were like, it's intriguing. But where are you? Because I tried to stay out. Yeah, where's your story in this, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't. I didn't really want to tell a, a story about myself, but we continued to edit it and then decided to go back the next summer and shoot. And this time it was just me and um, with my camera and, and shot my folks and and me and and um, and you know the growth that had happened in our relationship from me initially asking the hard questions to even that summer, the next summer, was just amazing. And I think that healing only happens for families and for people who struggle um, with different ideologies uh, once we have open communication and start telling stories and saying, well, here's how I see it. Well, here's how I see it. And so in the end, we put together a a film that was maybe 60 minutes and... um, 
and it 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 did well. You know, it went to a lot of different film festivals and got picked up by Sundance and the distributor and all that. And it was pretty cool. But you know, what probably the most one of the coolest moments of being a part of that film was we we were home in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, mm-hmm. screening the film at Crossroads Film Festival, and half of the audience was the wonderful people that I grew up in our Southern Baptist Church with, and the other half of the audience was a more liberal, um, gay-loving um, folks where, you know, I had gone to college at Millsaps and kind of that crowd. Mm-hmm. And it was just such a delightful time to spend an hour and a half with those people in a really kind of seemingly yeah. awkward situation, but but the the film was really balanced. It didn't say I'm right and my parents are wrong. It, it was just about the tension. Right? Was about how do you love yeah. people and have a good relationship with people when you fundamentally disagree mm. and your ideologies don't mix. And so it's it it had a lot of it had a profound effect on my relationship with my parents and also um, people in the crowd, and they felt heard and listened to from both sides. And so that was really cool. Yeah, talk about the reaction to the film in, just in that evening at the screening. I, I would assume you were there for some Q&A yeah. afterward and those sorts of activities. What was that like? Yeah, it was really cool. I mean, I just remember people just being grateful for a film that was two-sided and not heavy one way or heavy the other way. And I remember people standing up and saying, you know, I had this experience with my parents, too. Mm -hmm. And I believe some even brought their parents to the film. And it just opened a dialogue for more families to go through that healing process of open communication and how we love each other, um, regardless of our belief systems. And, um, and, you know, that really um, led me down a path of realizing that um, stories have the power to change the world. Yeah, yeah. And did you think at that moment, like, this is what I I need to do? I need to tell stories? Yes. But yeah. it doesn't mean that it didn't come with a lot of fear and vulnerability. Oh, of course. Yeah. And a lot of conditions like, I will never tell my story again. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, that was I mean, enough that for me. That has to be very yeah, vulnerable. Yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, um, it was quite a deal. So, okay, this passion for storytelling, this this realization that it can really change hearts and minds and bring people together – what was your next what was your what was your action plan from there yeah that pretty much set me on a path of being a documentary filmmaker for a while yeah. we made a couple of films in Haiti um about this amazing hospital that was started by the Mellons in the 50s in the Artibonite Valley and I got to go there several times and tell the story of reforestation and medical okay. care and disease and um how you know just the beautiful beautiful spirit of Haitians um you I think one thing about a, a place when you say the word Haiti and then you go and you meet those people and you realize actually they know more about community mm-hmm. and supporting one another than any other people I've met. And um, so it was cool to work and um, and to tell that story and to meet many friends there. Um, and then an opportunity arose uh, for me to tell, help tell another big story, which is... Um, kids who go through the foster care system in America and what happens to them okay. when they age out of the system. And so mm. that set me down a path of, um, I originally got with my producing partner, Matt Anderson, and we were going to make a five minute film and it turned into a three year project and a feature film that led to major national child welfare reform. Wow. And that film was called From Place to Place. What is the typical age where somebody ages out of foster 18. care? Is it 18? Yeah. And 18 what, to what, what are kind of some of the typical... Things that if there is there is, is there such thing as a typical pathway? Yeah, I mean, um, when you don't have a family, um, and then the government says, "Okay, you're done with mm-hmm. the family that we've been able to provide you," that can that can lead to some pretty um, poor results, as you can imagine. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, unfortunate statistics uh, about that. But what was so cool about that film is that we followed uh, six kids in Montana as they aged out. And listen to their stories. And really, as we went through the three years, it became Mandy and Ray's story. And um, they got invited to come to Capitol Hill to uh, tell their stories. And that's what started the pathway to this, you know, the most significant piece of child welfare legislation reform that's been mm-hmm. passed in the last 35 years. In fact, Becky Ship, who's a co-author of that bill, calls Mandy the, gra- the godmother. Okay. And so for a little, you know, she says a little girl from Montana to make such a difference was a big opportunity, which again goes to that philosophy and my belief that stories being able to 
tell our stories has the power to change the world. Um, and so it was just really humbling to be a part of that as uh, in that film and see what it did. And the film came out um, 10 years ago now. Mm-hmm. And at some point, and I've heard you say this, that, that you realized that you were a better storyteller than maybe a technical filmmaker. Yes. Is that <laughs> the way of describing it? Like your, your, your films would win the most popular award and the aud- audience award, right. so to speak. And at some point you made a decision to, to – go into your current venture, yes, the audience award. Yes, so. um, it, It's true. I think, um, you know, I love interviewing people and just finding out their story. And mm-hmm. I, I think that's, you know, it's it's where my passion is. And I happen to have run a camera while asking those questions and then looking at an editing bay saying, okay, here's the, you know, how we put this together. Um, but I, I'm not, you know, um, a great cinematographer and in fact, that camera that I shot with uh, from place to place is a relic now. It's like mm-hmm. VHS <laughs> in everyday terms. and Betamax. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I, I got done with that film and, and was figuring out something else to do. And I, I was pretty worn out. I was yeah. uh, I was just exhausted. and um, So do looking, a tech startup for that a change. That seems like a good thing to do when you're exhausted. Yeah, so <laughs> so I, I think I... I think I literally Googled how to start a tech company. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but um, when I was doing Queen, this is what I was going to say earlier, I, I had, uh, you know, basically done a Kickstarted method before Kickstarter. I went on MySpace because this was before Facebook was big. Yeah, just getting the word out, I getting did people PayPal. to pitch in. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, this time I kind of had this idea to create audience awards and a belief that stories can change the world. And so I wanted to build a platform where we could give more people like me opportunities to get discovered, um, have their films out in public and um, start telling stories and and have a way to monetize uh, their creativity. And that was in 2013. And you've been at it, so seven years. And I want to talk about the platform and and how that works. I also want to talk about the path because it has been a circuitous path from what I understand. But basically, so the initial motivation was to give filmmakers a platform to get their stories out there under the pre- presumption that stories can be a way of positively changing the world. Mm-hmm. Right. And so how does it work with giving those filmmakers, filmmakers pathways to monetization? So um, when I was traveling the festival circuit with my films, I, you know, you'd, you'd see these great shorts and you wouldn't see them again. And it was yeah. hard to find them. And Vimeo wasn't Vimeo, uh-huh. the Vimeo we know today. I and mean, we didn't even have Instagram yet. And, no. you know, it was a pretty different world in 13, even though that doesn't seem too Doesn't long seem ago. that long ago. But, no. yeah, fundamentally different in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. But, you know. And so so I thought, well, we'll, we'll run online film festivals. And um, not only will we give a home for short films, but we'll also drive an audience because people can ask their friends and family to vote on it. And then... You know, that'll be great because they'll build their communities through our platform and help the whole e- ecosystem. And then when I was figuring out how to monetize it, I realized I called up some, I think someone at the um, Montana Office of Tourism and said, would you like to sponsor this film festival that I have, um, I'm thinking of? And the first thing we ever did was a friendly Grizz versus Cats uh, sure. film challenge against yep. the film schools. And that was pretty cool. And they were like, you know, I don't really want to sponsor an online film festival, but we would love for your filmmakers to create content for our brand. Mm. So that's how I realized that we could monetize Light bulb. Yeah. Yep, through um, attaching brands to filmmakers. And so that started us down a path of running video contests and film challenges. And we do that for brands and organizations and for nonprofits. And we love, I think the biggest fit is when we have You know, um, a mission, the call to action to filmmakers is something that is a game changer. Yep. And then um, we can call on the filmmakers to submit something from their portfolio that they already have or that it's enough passion led that they are motivated to go create something new. Sure. And that's always a win, especially if it provides a great opportunity for a filmmaker. And so a brand comes to your platform and how do they kind of what's what's the structure of a pitch? How do they sort of request submissions. Yeah, that all happens through our platform. It's turnkey. So we work with the brand to say what kind of content do you want yeah. our filmmakers to create? And it's all short form. And um, and so... But they're they, not saying, like, we want, you know, a filmmaker to sell this pair of sneakers. 
they're saying we want to tell some kind of a story or, or like how much what are what are the guardrails that a, that yeah. a brand puts upon a, a filmmaker or an aspiring filmmaker? Sometimes it's really specific, um, okay. but generally, if it's if the call to action is wrapped around cause or purpose, it's more successful. Yeah. So our filmmakers aren't really like a an ad agency that's going to create a thirty second spot. Right. Right. But we, um, yeah. So so some of the some of the ones that have been the most fun have been like a. a a filmmaker challenge for women, female directors, um, with women in film, Los Angeles and Chloe Wines, mm-hmm. um, or GoDaddy with you know small business stories, or Better Business Bureau with small business stories. Um, we just ran one for um, it, this was a small one for the Open Source Montana Pack. Okay, and it's like what what values should our next Montana governor have? And mm. so people say what's important to them yeah. in our next governor. And then travel always does really well. We've done um, contests of like why I love and live in Louisiana or Colorado or Montana or Virginia. Mm-hmm. So um, usually it's when you give an opportunity, a creative, uh, a creative opportunity to a creative person using a creative platform where it creates a triple win. Okay. And so how are the once – so the brand comes on the platform, puts out a call – Filmmakers submit their work either from portfolio or if they're particularly passionate about the call, they'll make something yeah. new. How is that? Is that where the audience come in? Comes yeah. in is, is selecting the winner or the- right? So they might have two or three months um, to learn about the call to action and then submit, and then submissions close, and then it's generally two rounds of yep. uh, voting and jurying. So um, we qu- we quickly learned that uh, we couldn't just let the audience to the m- vote yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and determine the winners because then it becomes more about influencers yep. versus quality. And so the way we manage that is through two rounds. So generally the way it works is in the first round, everyone tells their friends or doesn't tell their friends um, to go vote. And so those videos get shared. And so the brand gets Oh, the all- filmmakers all say, yeah. hey, I just or, made or, this film. Yeah. Tell other friends, go vote on this new platform. Yep. Okay. And say maybe the top five most voted, and then the top five selected by the jury or preliminary jury are chosen, and then the next week is a finals round where those ten are looked at by the finalist jury, and usually the brand makes up the jury, and they choose their favorites. So okay. audience vote influences the winner but doesn't ultimately choose the winner mm-hmm. unless the jury selects the top ten and then the audience votes on those top ten. So there's a couple – tricks we have yeah 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 you'd have to sort of maintain a little bit yeah we have to curate it (laughs) yeah or else you could have disaster (laughs) totally and then okay so you're connecting brands with artists filmmakers Mm -hmm. and so i assume at some state the brands compensate the artists for their work so that that helps filmmakers and how does audience awards sort of oh the brand ends meet yeah the brand pays us a fee to provide this opportunity and the marketing platform the submissions platform and then all of the Social media. So you sort of get a finder's fee of a sort. Yeah, it's like SaaS. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Software as a service. And then the bigger the audience, the the sort of the more valuable your platform in many ways. So often a brand is getting doing it for to increase their audience and to get content. Um, We just launched a new feature on the platform where every video submitted to a contest or a film challenge or submissions opportunity has a lead generation button. Mm -hmm. And so now it's going to allow brands to, um, you know, actually get customer videos. And so that lead generation button is why they're doing it. So tell us how you use your, your, our product and why you love it. And then, um, and then each video will have that lead generation. That's a funnel for brands to, find like-minded customers. Yeah, the whole user-generated content thing yeah. flows right we're, into it. We're about to get into that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I'm just sort of t- trying to think about like how how people online find the audience awards. Like if I'm cruising around looking for, you know, what's going to get me to switch off of YouTube to mm-hmm. find cool films at, at your platform? Yeah, it's, it's really an organic growth yeah. play because we've always been bootstrapped, so we've never right. spent time on acquisition. So generally it's because somebody shares it and then someone starts watching and I often hear that, oh man, I got on your platform and then I was just there for hours. Yeah. So there's so much great content. Well, I mean, that's what happened to me. I watched, I think oh, it was really? called Surfer Dan. Oh yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> it just feeds up the next one yeah. and it's all yeah. super compelling stuff. And I know it's not driven by some algorithm that's made to sort of engineer me into darker places. Right, right. No, um, it's not yet. 
<laughs> Don't say that, Paige. Come on. Come on. No, you know, there's a huge opportunity. Yeah. Um, Google actually has created a bigger opportunity for us as with the adpocalypse and YouTube and demonetizing mm-hmm. channels. And so we're positioned uh, in a great place. Like if, if it, everyone, I think, could agree that YouTube is the major league of baseball. And yes. I think we're in a great position to potentially become the minor league. And so my job right now is to figure out how to do that. Yeah, it, seem, it would seem there's a lot of space there. Totally. What I'd like to get to now, though, is you've been at this for s- seven years, and it's been a, a long and winding path from what I understand. Can you, mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it hasn't been easy. You know, I, I, um, I'm very much of the belief that the more founders share their true story, yeah. founder story, the more founders like me can feel um, like, okay, it's okay. It's okay if today didn't go great or this month didn't go great or this year didn't go great. Right. I mean, as long as we keep the doors open, we still have a business. And sometimes that's that's like the only thing that's been winning. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's been awesome. And it's like, oh, we're going to do X, Y, Z this quarter. And so, yeah, it has not been a straight linear path. It has not been easy for me or my team or the people who've been around me. Um, But we've been we've had a hell of a good time. I can't imagine having done anything else. Mm -hmm. So even though, or maybe because of the struggle and because of my own personal, spiritual, familial growth through the hard times and the good, um, you know, I think it's, it's worth it. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's been all kind of, all kind of good things and not so great things with trying to run a crazy tech entertainment startup from Missoula, Montana. A New Angle is brought to you by First Security Bank and Blackfoot, two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. Hey, this is Coulter Nuanas from ESPN Missoula, and you're listening to A New Angle. Yeah, can we talk about some of those highs and lows? Um, I still have the first dollar that the company ever made. Really? Yeah, and I had my staff sign it. Yeah. I saw that the other day in the drawer, and it kind of brought me right back oh, to that gosh. moment of elation. Yeah. Yeah. What was, how did you make the first dollar? Um, I believe it was that Grizz Cat. We oh, monetized yeah. the platform as soon as we opened the doors because That's right. I had to. Mm-hmm. I mean, not because I had to, but I didn't know any different. You probably charged them more than a dollar. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I went and cashed the check and said, may I get a dollar back from this, please? <laughs> right, right. Put it all in the account except for one dollar. Yeah. I think that was Blackstone Launchpad that, that when pa- Pam Hexby Cody was over it when it first came. Okay. Yeah, when I it first was, was here. that was it. Pam was my first dollar, perhaps, Wonderful. in Blackstone. Okay. Which is great, yeah. given their mission. Absolutely. Um. And so every sell to me is a huge win. Those are like always the good times. Mm -hmm. Um, When cash flow is tight and I can't make payroll, those are always the lowest times. Yeah, yeah. And so what we had to do and what was the hardest lesson for me was to learn how to be, like to realize that um, some choices I made with the company, my board and I made with the company, was not putting us on a trajectory of raise, 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 grow fast, grow fast, grow fast. And I definitely chose to kind of go this bootstrappy pioneer Montanan way okay. um, to grow this company, which has good things and um, maybe not good things with it. And so um, where was I going with that, Justin? The, um, the choice, the consequences of those choices have definitely turn, you know, taught me a ton I don't know anything different, though. Since we haven't raised uh, institutional financing from VCs, like I don't, I don't know what that looks like. I mean, I know my friends' stories yeah, about that. Yeah. Are you are you just sort of philosophically against that from the start, yeah. or that just wasn't an option, or I wasn't. It was well, it possibly, probably was not an option for me. Okay. At that point, um, as we all know. Uh, female founders get 2% of all VC money. Right. That right. is statistic is getting better. And now more women are controlling the do- dollars. And so now we're to a point where it's a lot easier to raise uh, financing as a woman. And you had Erica on your show. And of mm-hmm. course, she raised the largest seed round in Montana, which is right. awesome. Love Erica Mackey guys. from My yes. Village. Yeah. Yep. And so that's not really an issue anymore. And so now. Well, I'd say it's less of an issue, right? Less of an issue. Yes. Yes. Um, but um, now I don't necessarily need VC money, and so hmm. that's so now it's a different, a different issue, a different thing to think about. Yeah. So how? So it's all sort of self finance or, or bootstrap financed. Yep. 
Um, Raise some angel money early on, but okay. no institutional money. Yep. Okay. And uh, and that now creates a lot of more flexibility and autonomy for you as a leader, right? Totally. And yeah. that's kind of what, like what I weigh and measure. Sure. Is I get to walk around and you know have coffee and just talk to people and build relationships and think about the future, which I love, versus thinking about um, exponential 10x growth day every day or month over month. And that's a different right. How to make a choice. ton of money fast for other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so we're, you know, we're, we're profitable now and comfortable. We're a small team. We have daily growth. Mm-hmm. Um, so things are pretty good. Some new things are happening in 2020 that are exciting. And I don't know the end result of those things, but um, it's a good place to, to get to ultimately. And I'm excited about the future, but getting here definitely was not easy. Yeah. What, um, I mean, what are some, some things if you were to go back and change, what would you do differently this time. Uh, oh, that's a really doing good question. So I wouldn't name my platform Audience Awards. Okay. Yeah, um, because it doesn't really say what it is. Yeah. And I'm actually considering a rebranding, mm. and I'm not sure. We can talk about um, that. Okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> let's talk about that. Um, I have a couple of ideas, but anyway. So. Yeah, and, I mean, names are interesting in that they they can they convey a lot or not a lot, and then there is a certain momentum. Right. Like if you start out life with a signature that you're not happy with, it becomes very hard to change it. Yeah. Um, although it's possible to change, it takes courage and effort and, and so forth, and, and you got to weigh weigh those costs and benefits for sure. Yeah, and it's always interesting. You know that phrase, "good is the enemy of great." Yeah. And so I'm always thinking about that too. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So maybe a different name. What else? I would I would have raised money. I would have made a choice. Either I'm going to raise money pre-revenue, okay, and like raise enough money that it will just lead me to Series A. Just create a launch a runway. Like just do that. Yep. Like decide I'm going to go VC and I'm going to do it from the very beginning. Okay. Or I would have not taken any um, fundraising money mm. or any uh, investment and just stayed very very lean. Because what happened with the company was I raised some angel money. Thinking I was going to do X, Y, Z, that didn't happen. And then I didn't feel like I was in a position to really go raise VC money. Got it. You sort of took this middle path, it sounds like. Yeah. And so, you know, so then I let people go. So then I, you know, we've been moving forward since then. Mm -hmm. Um, But those are hard times. Yeah. Totally. Although, you know, what is such a gift is... Oh, I've had such good teams and good people work with me, and they all got to their next level in their career as um, because of the work that we did together. So that was super fun. Mm-hmm. Building those bridges, absolutely. Yeah. Particularly in a town like this. I mean, you're super active or have been active in our entertainment management program, different uh, initiatives around the community. So that's got to feel good, too, to be building something here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of, yeah, it was, it's really good. And, you should go kind of going in that weird middle ground, but I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, it was my first tech company. Now I know. Now I, I get why some people don't like invest in first time founders because mm. second time, third time, fourth time founders, yeah, like they get it. They I know. mean, that was part of Erica's story. Yes, right. Second she's time. done. She's done a few things. Yes, she had a bit of a track record. Yep. So okay, so what's what's next for Audience Award? I mean, it sounds like you're you're humming along, sort of stable. Mm-hmm. Um, in a place that feels comfortable yeah. in a way? Like, what are, what are you thinking? There's a few exciting things. We're working with a strategic partner to launch an OTT channel with all of our short films. Okay, tell us what OTT stands for. That stands for Over the Top. Over the Top. That's like your Netflix, your Hulu. But then in the um, other worlds, or like if you turn on your connected TV, your Vizio or your Samsung, there's Zumo and Tubi and Pluto. And this is what the way people watch TV now instead of yeah. linear. So um, we'll have a shorts channel, which is super Interesting. fun. Yeah. yeah. And um, we are going to launch these uh, user-generated video contests for customers versus filmmakers. So that's exciting. And then we're getting into some production. And mm. I haven't made anything in 10 years. Okay. But we had something – I had something really interesting pop up in the last – 30 days, and so it's uh, creating a new line item in our P&L, and, and now all of a sudden, Audience Awards is a producer of multimedia projects. Okay, so let's be specific here. Okay. You got the itch to make some film again. Well, I'll tell you what happened. Or somebody asked you to. Yes, but here's what happened. If you okay. ask the universe for something, that it, you know, it always responds. I'd started doing the artist's way 
maybe in August, which is like a 12 week course I just read through and okay. um, to open up to the possibility of being creative, uh, doing my own work. I love building platforms and stages for people to tell their stories. And I hadn't done that in 10 years for my own stories. Mm -hmm. And so I started uh, just becoming open to maybe I am an artist and maybe I am a creative person. It's in there. <laughs> and what does that mean? Yeah. And so um, we had just done, well, we just ran our film festival here in Missoula. And uh, my old producing partner from From Place to Place and I had reconnected on the 10 year anniversary of From Place to Place. And he had this really great idea um, for something called the Family Institute mm -hmm. um, to help families across the country. And that, uh, so he came to Missoula. And we spent a weekend together, and we put together um, a potential um, uh, three potential projects to do, and one's a podcast, and one's uh, in several film challenges using audience awards and a documentary. And then the next week, um, he went and they pitched it, and it got it, it got greenlit. Huh? Yeah. And so now here we are. You're making a film. I'm making a film, and I didn't even know what the film was, but now I think I know what it is. Can you tell us what it is? Yes, it's about um, youth um, learning slam poetry to tell their stories and then going to compete against one another. There's a lot in that. What What is slam poetry? Well, I don't know. We're going to find out. <laughs> Do you have any idea? <laughs> no, yeah. It sounds yeah, like fun. You know, slam poetry. No, I don't. That's you don't why know? I asked. No, what is oh. it? How do you define slam poetry? I don't know, man. I don't know how you define slam poetry. It's like, you know, rapping. It's like the, the it's before rapping. Okay. Like the fundamentals of uh, poetry going fast. It's yeah, almost yeah, like yeah. you could put music to it and it'd be awesome. It's like hip hop. It's like the origins of that. Right on. Um, yeah. And so there's a group over in California that uh, my friend leads and, and they do like a boot camp to teach these kids slam poetry to tell their stories. And then they kind of do this on the other uh, coast with an organization um, called Say So, and they, they, they t learn to tell their stories, and so we're going to teach them slam poetry from the experts, and then they'll come together in either D.C. or Disney World and, and maybe other organizations from around the country, and it kind of like, even when I was putting the, um, the, the inspiration together and what this was going to be, this lyric came to me, and it, it was, um, doesn't matter if you're um, West Coast or East Coast, black or white, every kid deserves a family and a place to sleep at night. Mm. And that's kind of just the inspiration, and we'll see what hap what happens. So, but now, the path forward is to go into development to find out who those characters are and start shooting a little, and um, who's gonna who are gonna be the slam poetry yeah. experts, and who are gonna be the kids, and then following these stories. And so it, it's in the spirit of like War Dance or Spelling Bee or Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah, you seem super jazzed about it. I'm so excited. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I've ever had an inspired idea hit me in the face like this. Yeah. And so, so into productions or starting sort of mm -hmm. pre-production now, and sort of what's the timeline on the project? Um, we're hoping to be through development in the next six months and then go into pre-production. Okay. So my guess is if everything goes to plan, which nothing ever does, but if I was to just wave a magic wand and it all work out, um, we would probably be um, releasing the film in late 2021 or early 2022. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to that. Thanks. I'm pretty excited. Yeah, it sounds it sounds awesome. I, I um wanted to circle back to a topic you alluded to before, and I, I I mentioned something about it also. So I'm just interested in in how the future of a platform like yours in this world where these giant monopoly companies are just gobbling up mm -hmm. audience. I mean, if, and your platform's interesting in that it doesn't it doesn't rely on ad revenue. Because all the ad traffic goes to YouTube, goes right. to Google, goes to well, and Facebook. But your platform is a little different. Yet you have to capture audience for brands to feel like it's worth it to engage. I would think. I mean, the audience is a key part of your sort of your your stool in a way. It is. It's not the most important part, though. Okay. And I think brands have to learn how to tell an authentic story. And I think the best way for them to know how to do that is to ask creative talent around the world to teach them that. Hmm. And that's the real value. Yeah. That that kind of shakes my head a little bit in the sense that I'd like to feel like brands have an authentic story from the start, but I, I, many don't. You know. 
Yeah. Or many, maybe, maybe the point is they don't know how to tell it. They have a story and they just don't know how to get it out there. Right. I mean, the traditional model is an agency goes into a room and thinks up an idea and they say, yeah, that's yeah. good. Let's yeah. go. Okay. And in this case, you have 50 creatives or 100 creatives telling your story from their lens. And we've had some pretty incredible stories come out of the our filmmaking community. I mean, one of my favorites is um, we were running a, a film challenge or a video contest for Southwest Air. Okay. And it was Every Seat Has a Story. And that's their campaign, and that's a great tagline. And so the winning video was about um, the great-granddaughter – um, meeting of a slave owner, meeting the great great granddaughter of her family's slave family. Wow. Yeah. And so that's like a story that can't come out of an agency. No. Right. No, you'd have to go find that story. Yeah. And so there's just these really heartfelt stories that come out and um and they come from different perspectives because mm-hmm. we're a global community. We're naturally diverse. We're naturally more female um, and naturally organically, I guess is the word, um, non-white. And so you get uh, authentic stories of all kinds of people from all around the world. And uh, and it's really um, the future of storytelling. And it's really important as we get siloed in our belief system and um, speak in vacuums to our friends that we've accepted on whatever platform. Mm-hmm. What's really cool is to be able to see a lot of different points of view that just tell stories with heart versus, you know, just the same stuff being shared over and over by the same choir that we surround ourselves with. Yeah, it, it breaks the filter bubble right. in many ways. And then if it's a brand going through this t- the traditional agency path and they're going to get – um, just a much more constrained set of options. Yeah. I would think. I would think. And, and and I believe that the future of this industry are creative platforms. Yeah. That, uh, that attach um When you say this talent. industry, what do you mean this like industry? Like marketing and advertising okay. and brand okay. and like how do we – so so the, the, old, the old way doesn't work, right? Like we don't watch TV and watch an ad and then go to McDonald's or – The audience is not captive shoe. anymore. No. Yeah. So how do you capture a user? And I, I don't like watch something on YouTube and see an ad and go click through either. I mean, mm-hmm. not necessarily, you know, so how do you really, if you're a brand, I mean, everybody's job is if they're in business is to sell something. So how do you capture an audience? And I think that that's through authentic, creative storytelling that has heart. Mm-hmm. And I think as a society, uh, we have to tell these stories to break down the barriers to get to the next level um, and stop living in silos. What happens to films that uh, aren't selected by brands? I mean, what's the mechanism there? Yeah, they go on to live on the platform and okay. often they're resubmitted. And, um, you know, I mean, our users have complete control over their profiles and can upload and delete and all that. Um, so, so they get resubmitted. They yeah. could just be viewed and, and yeah. appreciated by by many people. Be part of a portfolio. Mm-hmm. So it's still a, it's still an asset for the creators. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And they learn so much by creating something, submitting, and then watching the people who submit it as well. Yeah. And a lot of times we're forming communities for filmmakers to go to work with one another. Okay. And to learn from one another. Yeah. So we did a podcast, I don't know, a little over a year ago with um, Jason Williams and Joe Fungi. Mm -hmm. And they were just getting C2M beta off the ground. And my understanding was Audience Awards was the inaugural kind of, I don't know if client's the right word, uh, participant, Mm -hmm. partner, um, target. Like What what were you to C2M beta? And tell us about that experience. Sure. So um, and I, I guess I should preface this by saying C2 and Beta is a part of Blackfoot. It's a bit of a tech incubator of a sort, and, 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 and you can tell us about it. Yeah, they call it, it a lab, and yeah. um, it's not your typical tech accelerator where you no. go through for a period of weeks and then exit. Um, but what it was is, is very Montana in, in nature, um, and we were there first through, so we were their guinea pig, and I love that. So we... They invested a little bit of money, and we um, got some downtown. We went into their downtown space, mm-hmm. um, met weekly 
on some um, work with the platform and just learn from one another. Um, I've helped them. I've helped Blackfoot with some innovative thinking. Sure. And they've helped me with some structure and resources, and and um, and it was awesome. Yeah, it was a cool partnership. It, it, adva- cool, it advanced cool the project. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. So, Justin. Yeah. You've been doing this podcast for two years? Over 100 episodes. E- e- well, yeah, as of right now. As, uh, by the time this airs, we'll be well into year three. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. Thanks. So you you sit you get to see, sit weekly with innovators and founders mm-hmm. and thinkers and educators and all artists, all kinds of people. What is is there a common thread? Like, what do you get out of it, and what do you hear over and over and over as people share their experience about being human and doing things? Yeah, a couple of the core themes that I hear are um, persistence and that there's no shortcuts. You know, the the, the grit and grind and, and all that. Um, come through in your personal story uh, your story with audience awards and it's come through whether it's a musician whether it's an athlete whether it's somebody in a traditional business somebody who's an entrepreneur somebody who's an artist they just grind and i'm not saying that 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 lesson is the oh yeah you just have to work harder than anybody else but you have to work hard you have to work smart and uh, stay at it uh, that seems to be the, the core theme that I take away. Yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of like, well, if you give up, then there's nothing to really talk about. Yeah, I mean, although there is the time to sort of, you know, there's the good money over bad fallacy, right? Where like if an idea is not working and you just keep plugging away at it and wasting uh, yes. time and money, like you, you got to have some wisdom there. Totally. But it seems like people that have great clarity of purpose and have found a passion, have found like this intersection between – Ability, passion, and um, some way to monetize it, some way to, 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 to create value that somebody's willing to pay for. Um, if they feel like they're on to that intersection and then have the, the, the drive to get grind on it, chances are they're going to make it. Yeah, that's come through pretty clearly. That's awesome. Yeah, it has been super fun. I mean, we started the, the show with this kind of premise of creativity and hustle, right? That this is a... T- and this town has changed even just in the last mm-hmm. couple of years. But, you know, my I started here in 2012, and, and, and my sense early on was that, wow, I'm really fortunate to have a stable job in a great town. And it appears that there's not a lot of those sorts of jobs in this town. And so people were working a ton of different things or putting together portfolio careers to, to enable them to live here. And so we started with these themes of creativity and hustle. Like it took creativity and hustle to figure out a way to put together a good life in this town and, um, and in this part of the country. And now it seems like that's changed. Like some of those pathways to gainful employment have increased. I mean, there's a lot more. I mean, look at Submittable mm-hmm. and Luminat and ClassPass and all the and Onyx Maps and all these companies that are kind of stable employers and creating a new generation of kind of you know, I don't want to say tech entrepreneurs, but but those, those sorts of jobs. Um, but yeah, it's still kind of an uh, we're on the frontier, and people have to be creative and have to be willing to hustle to make it. Yeah, it, it makes me think of often. You know, I'm traveling around the country, and people say, "Well, they assume I'm based in LA," and then I say, "Well, I'm in Missoula, Montana," and, mm. and they're you know, I get a couple of responses, but. Um, People are, most people don't know what all we have going on here. And, you know, I think that those companies you just mentioned are the direct result of creative hustle. And now they're employing hundreds of people. And it's so cool. And it's really cool to be a part of the Missoula creative hustle ecosystem. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's it's interesting in that they figured out that, that with technology, you can do work here that is deliverable all around the right. world. And then on top of that, it's a place where a workforce wants to be. And they want to build roots and life and stability here. Unlike, you know, people move to Silicon Valley and it's sort of like a badge of honor. Or I shouldn't say this. It's like a sign that something's wrong with you if you haven't switched jobs in 18 months from company to company. And and there's some of that. There's people moving around here, and that'll always happen. But people want – people here tend to 
tend to want to build some roots and stick around and they want to be here. And so um, for companies to sort of grow and capitalize on that, um, I think it'll ultimately be really good for the community. I mean, people sort of talk about growth and I think there's reasonable concerns with what, what growth looks like here. But my impression of the people that are driving a lot of that growth is that they're, they're asking the right questions. Yeah, um, about what that growth. And hopefully, look like. it leads to more equity and diversity, which is really exciting opportunity for our community. Yeah, I mean, I think those are big questions, right? What's what are we going to do about housing? What are we going to mm-hmm. do about the homeless situation? How are we going to ensure equal access to education and all those sorts of um, important factors for a community to be actively managing totally someone told me today i should move to la and i was like no way like my kids go to lewis and clark and washington middle school don't you know what that means like that means the world to have such a great public school right down the street and we don't have to lock our doors you know i mean it just and and i don't you know anywhere i want to go is five to ten minutes away and you did your first because this this latest film fest was your third. The first yes. two were in L.A. and yes. you brought the third one up here. Yeah, it was it, awesome. Yeah, and it was it was the theme was empowering women and in, yes. in innovation. Yeah, so let's talk about that. That's something we haven't okay. talked about. Um, yeah, I decided to move the festival here, um, and I'm really glad I did. And um, it was great. And you know, I I, um, I started. When we did the festival in L.A., we had uh, people in media and entertainment do the panels, and we don't have too, that, too much of that here. I mean, we have Complexly and um, probably a couple other people I'm forgetting right now, um, but not too much media and entertainment. And so I started looking around at, you know, who would make great speakers and what would make great topics. And I don't know, I can't remember the inspiration, but I was just like, I'm just going to provide a stage for women to tell their stories. Hmm. And... Um, I think often, you know, I'm I'm often the only woman in a room in my world. Yeah. Like, that's so common in Montana. Um, And so I was like, yeah, we'll just do all women. Why not? And so uh, we had about 35 female leaders um, speaking about innovation. And it was everything from um, funding women to female founders to uh, the sea change here Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. um, to... um, innovation and nonprofits and companies. And um, we had this really great panel with the uh, women leadership of those companies you mentioned, like OnX and ClassPass and uh, Complexly and um, others, Submittable, talking about their roles and their jobs in, in the company and, and how they see company culture and innovation. And so it was great to just bring together a group of um, like-minded women and a really strong, engaged audience um, and provide another stage for voices and stories to be told. And, you know, we probably won't do it in that way again, um, but it was really special and and it was super fun and everybody had a great time. And and that's what I, I love. I just love connecting people and putting people together and saying, you meet her and you meet her and and um, so that we can help each other, you know, get the work done and have some fun along the way. So it was awesome. And we screened some films, too. <laughs> yeah. The connecting people piece seems to be the theme page that I'm, I'm taking away, not only it. from your interest in, in, pro- in making and producing film, but also in, in the whole sort of just guiding values behind your platform. It's really wonderful. Thank you. So best of luck um, with Audience Awards, with the new film. Probably doesn't have a name yet. Is there a working no. title for the project there other isn't. than Slam Poetry, which is yeah, awesome? No, we're not. I'm There's probably, not a working title Maybe I'm yet. the only one listening that didn't know what Slam Poetry is. But now I do, and I'm, I'm stoked about maybe seeing a movie about it. I'll send you some, some examples. You should check out my friend Steve Connell. He's pretty great at it. I will. Paige, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Glad to be here. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a gift from University of Montana alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. And remember that A New Angle is supported by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. These guys pretty much sell anything electrical you would ever need, but they also hire a ton of our students. If you want to learn more about jobs at CED, visit cedcareers.com. Before we go, I want to thank some important peeps Our awesome interns, Aspen Runkle and Max Gibson, Jeff Amet, John Wicks, and VTO for the tunes, and finally, props to Jeff Meese, our master of all things sound. 
Finally, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at a new angle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag a new angle when you do. Thanks a lot and see you next time.